So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the questions. We're going to see what your answers to the questions. And then we'll have Amy give you an overview on the, everything you need to know about systemic hypertension. So let's go to the first question here. Based upon the JNC8 guidelines, and Amy's going to talk about these guidelines, which of the following medications is recommended as the initial therapy for a 56-year-old black man with type 2 diabetes and hypertension, blood pressure is running about 150 over 90, normal renal function, and no proteinuria? Give lisinopril, valsartan, hydrochlorothiazide, or atenolol? Very appropriate question. Let's see the answers. You see the answers? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is, this is giving Amy some <laughs> ammunition here of what she needs to emphasize. Uh, question number two. You've got a 38-year-old woman uh, blood pressure readings are about the 140s over 90 range. Um, her office blood pressure is 149 over 87. Um, she drinks one alcoholic beverage a day. Her body mass index is 32. She's a non-smoker and no family history of coronary artery disease. She walks for about 30 minutes a day. Oral contraceptives were started six months ago with cetirizine. What's the appropriate initial step for the management of her hypertension? Lifestyle changes, weight loss, discontinue alcohol, discontinue her OCP, or start hydrochlorothiazide? All right. We'll go on. A 75-year-old woman has not received routine medical care, presents to the emergency department with severe chest pain radiating to her back, bad sign. Uh, blood pressure 210 over 95, bad sign. Heart rate of 115, incredibly bad sign. <laughs> chest x-ray shows a widened mediastinum. ECG shows sinus tachycardia and LVH. While she is going for your emergency CT angiogram or TEE to evaluate for dissection, what medication would you want to use acutely for her blood pressure? Um, IV sodium nitroprusside, IV labetalol, IV hydralazine, or oral metoprolol? Okay. And this after, Amy will be talking to you about the acute management of hypertension, but this afternoon we have a whole session on vascular disease. We're going to go into the aortic syndromes. Um, at this point in time, I'll have Amy come on up, um, introduce her learning objectives, and give you an overview on hypertension. Great. Thanks so much, Nish and Steve, for inviting me to be part of this fantastic conference. Um, I'm still getting used to this microphone in my ear and not having to focus on these guys right here. But I'm thrilled to be here with you all this morning. I mean, who what doesn't want to talk about hypertension on a Saturday morning? And um, my goal is to really highlight the areas that you're going to need to know for the boards. And as Nish pointed out, really with all of these talks, there are going to be areas of controversy. And these JNC8 guidelines are certainly one of those areas of controversy that we'll be talking about. So for our five learning objectives, we'll start off very basically defining the stages of hypertension, discuss indications for treatment, and then looking at appropriate management strategies for patients with hypertension, going into resistant hypertension and selecting appropriate treatment, and then moving on to the secondary causes of hypertension and then how we can use that information to manage our patients. And then lastly, ending with malignant hypertension and the treatment of that as a medical emergency. 
So to begin with the stages of hypertension and when to treat, this is something that was outlined back in JNC7 and wasn't um, included in JNC8, but it's a usual, uh, useful framework to really set the stage. Optimal blood pressure, less than 120 over 80. You have the pre-hypertension, those systolics in the 120s up to 139, stage one hypertension, and then stage two as you get over 160. 160 systolic. So for the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, there's really the six-hour ambulatory blood pressure test can be really helpful if you have patients who you're trying to determine is this white coat hypertension. And so often patients are not always compliant with checking their blood pressure as regularly as we'd like to really answer the question, is it only high in the doctor's office or do they really have undiagnosed hypertension? So a six-hour test can be useful for that. The 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure test is very helpful if you have patients you're concerned about nocturnal hypertension. They say, Doc, my blood pressure is always high first thing in the morning. I take my medications, and it's going down really low over the course of the day. This is definitely my go-to test for that, as well as if you need to get a little bit more information other than just the six-hour blood pressure test when you have discordant findings between the home blood pressure readings and your office readings. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about this idea of masked hypertension, where their office blood pressure readings are actually normal, but you're seeing signs of some end organ uh, damage and the role of blood pressure monitoring for that. So in terms of what's a normal blood pressure when you're doing the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, this is helpful because this is a testable um, point for the boards. So on a 24-hour blood pressure monitor, normal is going to be less than 130 over 80. So it's certainly lower than our traditional cutoffs, but that's because it's averaging your nighttime blood pressures as well. And at night, your blood pressure should really be less than 120 over 70. You have this typical 10% fall compared to your daytime blood pressures. When you look at the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring for that white coat blood pressure, again, the blood pressure is high in the office, normal with the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. That masked hypertension is where the blood pressure is actually normal in the office, but it's high on their 24-hour readings. And we'll talk about who we need to worry about that very specific scenario in. And then that nocturnal hypertension, where the blood pressure is greater than 120 over 70 at night. So for white coat hypertension, someone's blood pressure is high in the office, it happens about 20 to 30% of the time. And when you do the 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, if these patients actually have a normal, totally normal 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor, they have a very good prognosis. We can relax, they can relax. It's okay that their blood pressure goes up a little bit in the office. However, a lot of times their blood pressure is actually high and it's going up under periods of stress, whether or not they're in your office or just in their day-to-day -day life. And that's when they really need to be treated for hypertension. So this masked hypertension, that's again, blood pressure is low in the office, high on ambulatory reading. We need to be thinking of screening for these high-risk groups. If Again, if patients have target organ damage, left ventricular hypertrophy, they've had a prior history of stroke, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea, and then also in patients who are African American, there's a higher rate of this masked hypertension. So if we move then to the JNC-8 guidelines that were published in 2014, they were aiming to answer three questions. Are there specific thresholds that if we start treatment for hypertension that it's going to improve outcomes? Number two, does treating to a specific goal actually change outcomes? And then are specific medications or combinations more effective in certain groups of patients? And these are the recommendations, and this is something that I think folks are very familiar with at this point because it's been out for a couple of years. And this is where the controversy comes in because JNC-8 says that if you're a patient over the age of 60, blood pressure goal should really be less than 150 over 90. If you're under the age of 60, blood pressure goal is less than 140 over 90. And we'll talk a little bit about um, things the direction this is moving with more recent studies. But in terms of the boards, if you have a question, most of the time they'll put in the STEM, based on the JNC-8 guidelines, what should your management be? And that gives you a clue that over age 60, it's the higher blood pressure goal. 
for chronic kidney disease and then diabetes, similar blood pressure goal of less than 140 over 90, as is for the younger population, less than 60. And then a year later, after the JNC-8 guidelines, the SPRINT trial came out. And this is also something that is very familiar to, uh, to folks here. And we'll just go over some of the specifics for the SPRINT trial. So remember that it was in people over the age of 50, their blood pressure needed to be between 130 and 180, and they had to have some evidence of increased cardiovascular risk, whether or not it was subclinical cardiovascular disease or prior um, coronary disease. They excluded stroke, and they excluded patients with diabetes. And so there was the intensive blood pressure arm, and the goal was to have the systolic less than 120, and the standard blood pressure arm with the goal blood pressure less than 140. And what the SPRINT trial was looking at was this composite outcome. They were really setting themselves up for success because it was a composite of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, cardiovascular death, and acute to compensated heart failure. What they found between the intensive arm and the standard blood pressure arm, the intensive arm had an average blood pressure of 121. Remember, they were going for less than 120, but their average was 121, and folks were on an average of 2.8 medications. The standard blood pressure arm, average blood pressure of 136, and they were on average one less medication than the intensive group. And there was a difference in the primary outcome. The intensive group had 1.7% of their composite outcome per year compared to the standard group of 2.2%. There was also a mortality benefit to the intensive group. And this came at the cost of higher rates of hypotension, syncope, electrolyte abnormalities, and kidney energy, which makes sense. If we're pushing someone's blood pressure really low, that's the price that we're going to have to pay. And what's interesting, in the pre-specified subgroup of patients over the age of 75, there was still a benefit in a more intensive um, blood pressure lowering, again, knowing that you're going to be running the risk of higher rates of hypoten hypotension and syncope. So the SPRINT trial, I think, is going to impact JNC9 whenever that comes out. And right now, the American Heart Association is reviewing and undergoing an um, uh, update to the guidelines for hypertension and should come out sometime within the next year. So again, when we look at JNC8 versus the SPRINT trial, JNC8 would say less than age 60, blood pressure less than 140 over 90, over age 60, blood pressure less than 150 over 90. And the SPRINT trial is really turning this on its, on its corner. So I think in terms of clinical practice, many of us have adopted more along the lines of the SPRINT trial for selected patients. But again, for the boards, they're going to either ask you, based on the results of the SPRINT trial, would your management be X, Y, or Z, or JNC8. They're not going to have a scenario where it's really vague and you're trying to decide, do I need to apply SPRINT or JNC8? And if in doubt, I would go with the, the guidelines. The one nitpicky part the boards could look at is because the SPRINT trial did not apply to diabetic, or did not include diabetic patients or patients with stroke, and that's important to know about. So you should not be applying the results of SPRINT to stroke or diabetic patients. So then going on to diet, lifestyle, and medication approach to hypertension, we know that treating hypertension is beneficial. And this is a good framework that I like to share with patients in terms of a reduction in the risk of stroke by 35 to 40%, reduction in the risk of myocardial infarction by 20 to 25%, and then a reduction in the risk of heart failure by over 50%. And in terms of knowing which is the greatest reduction for the treatment of hypertension being heart failure, that is also a testable uh, point for the boards. And we may be able to diagnose their hypertension, come up with the appropriate treatment strategies and management long term, but there are so many other factors that go into patients' management of their blood pressure with regards to their adherence. Socioeconomic, their health system, condition-related and, and patient-related factors. And this really comes to play with regards to lifestyle. So I do think it's important that we counsel all of our patients with either prehypertension or hypertension regarding appropriate uh, lifestyle changes. And as you all know, not always do they heed our recommendations. But in terms of the benefit of weight loss, about one kilogram on average translates into one millimeter of mercury uh, reduction in blood pressure. 
A low sodium DASH type eating plan um, redu reduces blood pressure on average by about 11 millimeters of mercury. Dietary sodium alone, um, two to eight millimeters, physical activity, moderate alcohol use as opposed to large alcohol use, and then avoiding NSAIDs all can help improve blood pressure. This was an interesting systematic review of weight loss and the effect of blood pressure that again showed this relationship, four kilograms, about four points in systolic blood pressure. So it can have an impact, certainly weight loss on blood pressure. So how about lifestyle changes? We know that we need to recommend that to all of our patients, but when do we need to add medications? So this is from the Heart Association back in 2010. If patients are low cardiovascular risk and their blood pressure is less than 160 over 100 on that index diagnosis where you're saying your blood pressure is high, you have hypertension, you can give them lifestyle changes for three to six months. If their blood pressure is still high, then certainly that's where they need to start to add medications. On the other hand, if patients are at high cardiovascular risk, and traditionally this was defined as a Framingham risk greater than 10%, or if their blood pressure on the get-go was greater than 160 over 100, that's when we're needing to do both, the lifestyle changes with the medications. So in terms of those lifestyle uh, recommendations, the gestalt for the amount of salt is really somewhere less than 2,300 to 2,400 milligrams per day. There's a couple different guidelines, but that's about what we're looking at. And each of the guidelines will give a caveat that you can consider a more intensive lowering of sodium to less than 1,500 milligrams, and it may help some patients. There's just inconclusive evidence to say that all patients with hypertension should have a very stringent less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium. And then the three to four um, sessions of moderate exercise per week. This is just that other guidelines for the dietary sodium. So the salt sensitivity of blood pressure, this I thought was a really interesting scientific statement that came out um, just last year. And it speaks to the fact that not everybody is going to be sensitive to salt. However, most patients with hypertension are going to be salt sensitive. As we get older, our salt sensitivity goes up. And now that I'm 40, 45, I don't think is really all that old. Um, but certainly as our age goes up, the risk of salt sensitivity goes up. And then metabolic syndrome, blacks compared to other ethnic groups, and then women tend to be more salt sensitive. And this graph just shows that if you're normotensive in yellow compared to hypertensive in orange, as your age goes up from left to right, and you reduce the amount of salt in your diet, you can have a pretty dramatic impact on your blood pressure, much more so if you're hypertensive in orange, and much more so as your age goes up over 60 as you go to the right of the screen. So what about the sources of dietary sodium? I think this is something that everyone in our audience knows, but to a lot of patients, this is just not a second nature. They say, oh, I don't add salt to my food. I eat a low salt diet. And so I end up drawing out this kind of rudimentary pie graph in the office pretty often, because it turns out that smallest piece of the pie is for table salt. Eating out and then processed foods far and away have most of the salt that we're exposed to. And so having that time in the office to be able to counsel them about these hidden sources of salt can really have huge dividends. If we look then at hypertensive medications, and this um, diagram is going to be based on the JNC8 recommendations. If you have an adult with hypertension, everyone's going to get the lifestyle interventions. And then the blood pressure medications are going to be based on age, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. So if we start to the right of the screen first, chronic kidney disease, gold blood pressure less than 140 over 90, and this makes sense. You're going to start with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and then add additional medications as you need to, monitor, to manage their blood pressure. The part where it got controversial with JNC8 was with the diabetic group. So age less than 60 or diabetes, blood pressure less than 140 over 90, age greater than 60, we're tolerating that slightly higher blood pressure. And then in terms of which medication to start first, these guidelines were the first that really stratified people based on race. And this really comes from the All Hat trial. So if you are black and have diabetes, the recommendation is to start thiazide type diuretic or a calcium channel blocker first. And in fact, whether or not you are 
a diabetic or not, essentially if you are African American, the recommendation is a thiazide or calcium channel blocker first before you add an ACE inhibitor and ARB. And that's because in the ALHAT trial, there was a significant reduction in the risk of stroke, more so with uh, thiazide or with the calcium channel blocker than lisinopril for African-American patients. And that is something that's very testable for the boards. For non-blacks, you can really, dealer's choice, you can start with a thiazide, ACE inhibitor, ARB, calcium channel blocker, uh, and then titrate up as needed. And one other point just to make about this controversial population, African-American diabetics, and again, this is if they don't have any chronic kidney disease and no proteinuria, because if you have chronic kidney disease, which JNC8 defined as a creatinine clearance less than 60, or if you have any proteinuria, 30 grams in 24 hours, you fall into the CKD side, and that's where you are gonna be starting an ACE inhibitor and ARB first. However, if you're just a diabetic and you're African-American, you want to use a thiazide or a calcium channel blocker first, knowing that if, if you have about 20 or 30 points in your blood pressure to get down, a single agent's not going to be enough. So you're going to be starting a thiazide or calcium channel blocker in addition to an ACE inhibitor. So hopefully I've made that, that point clear. So just to, to recap the hypertension treatment, initial medications, general population, you have your choice. If you're African-American, you're starting first with a thiazide or a calcium channel blocker and then adding other drugs as needed. The chronic kidney disease, starting with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. For the potential for pregnancy, and Heidi Connolly is going to go over this population in detail later today, and she gives an awesome talk. I think using a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker is a good starting point. I don't start ACE inhibitors or diuretics in my uh, female patients who are looking to get pregnant. And then recent MI or heart failure, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, stable coronary disease, similar medications. So then titrating the medications, JNC8 outlined three options, basically said, you have your choice. You can either maximize the first dose uh, for your first medication, add a second medication before you've maximized that first dose, or start with two medications. And typically the patients that have that uh, stage two hypertension where their blood pressure is greater than 160 over 100, that's where you're starting to need to begin with two medications as opposed to just one. And if you're not a blood pressure goal, reinforce, reinforce lifestyle and adherence, and then go ahead and titrate up with medications from there. And then if you're not at goal blood pressure, despite the maximum dose of the diuretic, diuretic, the calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, ARB, then the next group of medications to go to really would be the aldosterone antagonist, like spironolactone or beta blocker. And then special populations with hypertension, we'll just touch briefly on the chronic kidney disease. This is where some of the controversies come with the goal blood pressure for CKD. Because if you look, in patients in orange who have a protein more than one gram per day, their risk, that are, they, those lines just wiggled over the, to the right of the screen, their risk of having progression of their chronic kidney disease really goes up if their systolic blood pressure is greater than 130. And JNC8 felt that the data wasn't strong enough to recommend a different cutoff for CKD with proteinuria, but some of the other guidelines do. Sleep apnea, there's limited data, but when the CPAP's applied and used properly, the effect on blood pressure can be significant, even 10 millimeters of mercury. And then just briefly on diabetes, there we could spend a whole day talking about intensive or not with blood pressure lowering in diabetes, but this is the results of the Accordion trial. So it basically built on the Accord trial and gave more longitudinal follow-up. So they followed patients for nine years, and what they found is that there was no difference in the composite endpoint of cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal MI, or um, non-fatal stroke with the more intensive blood pressure lowering in diabetic patients less than 120. We do know, however, that lowering blood pressure in diabetes is very effective overall in lowering mortality, cardiovascular disease, stroke, heart failure, and then renal complications. So we'll move on to resistant hypertension, and it's helpful to begin just with a definition. JNC7 defined resistant hypertension as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 in patients who are compliant with three drugs, including a diuretic. And all the drugs need to be at or near maximal doses. The AHA scientific statement defines it similarly, 
uncontrolled blood pressure despite three medications, or controlled but requiring four medications. And the true prevalence of resistant hypertension is not known. NHANES estimated that it was almost 9% of adults with hypertension. And Kaiser gave it a smaller estimate based on their study in California of 1.9%. But these patients certainly are at high cardiovascular risk. And when we look at the patients who have uncontrolled blood pressure, half is due to this pseudo-resistant hypertension, either improper blood pressure measurement, this white coat hypertension, or poor medication compliance in up to a third. And we're gonna focus on the orange side of the um, screen, that true resistant hypertension. And the causes, excess sodium intake is a huge cause of resistant hypertension. Inadequate diuretic therapy kind of goes along with that. Not having adequate medication doses, excessive alcohol intake, and then secondary causes of hypertension that we'll look at. So there are a lot of medication side effects that can lead to hypertension. Certainly non-steroidals are a major offender and looking at those, particularly for our elderly patients. Oral contraceptives, and what's interesting is if you stop the OCP in young women who are recently diagnosed with hypertension, the blood pressure returns to normal in about 50%. And then sympathomimetics, it's kind of a tongue twister, decongestant, so patients that are taking their Allegra D and they're having that daily exposure to the decongestant part of it. Stimulants, alcohol, certain antidepressants, and then some herbal compounds, so always making sure to ask about those. And then refractory hypertension, this is where my blood pressure really starts to go up, because patients have to be on five or more medications and inadequately controlled blood pressure, including the use of chlorothalidone and spironolactone. Luckily, this only occurs in a minority of resistant hypertension, so 3% of the resistant hypertension cases, but they can be a really challenging population to, to treat. So if we look at lifestyle intervention for resistant hypertension, these are the patients who I am considering that much lower sodium. Uh, some data even says less than 1.1 grams uh, per day for uncontrolled hypertension with resistant hypertension can have a dramatic impact on lowering blood pressure and then certainly exercise as well. If patients have resistant hypertension and sleep apnea, using CPAP also can lower blood pressure, although it's a pretty modest amount, three millimeters of mercury for systolic and diastolic. So if we look then at treatment of resistant hypertension, there is a laundry list of drugs that we have at our disposal. And what I'd like to propose is a three-step approach to resistant hypertension. So the first step is going to be to optimize diuretics. So you have the thiazides, thiazide-like diuretics like chlorothalidone, and then the loop diuretics. So if somebody has chronic kidney disease and a GFR less than 30, they need to be on a loop diuretic to treat the resistant hypertension. A thiazide's not gonna cut it. And remember, if chlorothalidone is twice as potent as hydrochlorothiazide. So if you have somebody that does have resistant hypertension, I'm generally transitioning them from chlorothalidone from hydrochlorothiazide, rather, to chlorothalidone. And keep in mind that rarely the thiazide diuretics can have an effect on lipids, in particular triglycerides, so just to keep an eye on those. Second step is really maximizing your dose of ACE inhibitor slash ARB and calcium channel blocker. And what's interesting, some of the studies show that using an ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker together, you get the synergistic effect that seems to be superior to an ACE inhibitor and a thiazide just together alone. And another study showed that ARBs and calcium channel blockers can control blood pressure in about 60% of individuals who had been on a prior three-drug regimen. So there seems to be a complementary ACE or ARB with calcium channel blocker and really maximizing those doses. And then third, mineralocorticoid antagonists. This is spironolactone or plerinone. You have to use them in patients who have a GFR more than 30. Certainly there's a risk of hyperkalemia and then the risk of breast tenderness or gynecomastia. And there really can be significant improvement in blood pressure with spironolactone as that additional drug with a blood pressure going down by 21 millimeters of mercury in the ASCOT trial. So in these last few minutes, we're gonna just touch on the secondary causes of hypertension and then go into hypertensive emergencies. By far and away, the three biggest causes of secondary hypertension are sleep apnea, hyperaldosteronism, and then renal artery stenosis. 
Pheochromocytoma is always on the list, and you certainly need to think about it, but those are gonna be the top three. So the clues in medical history, age of onset, if someone's younger than 30, considering fibromuscular dysplasia, older, atherosclerotic renal disease, sudden onset with an embolic event, or that episodic headaches, palpitations, chest pain, thinking about pheochromocytoma or thyroid, and then sleep apnea and, and snoring. So in terms of the, the tests that we order, screening for pheochromocytoma, the plasma metanephrines, sometimes if your suspicion's high enough, that 24-hour urine, and then primary hyperaldosterone, and I wanna focus on that, because the potassium, although we were taught in medical, medical school is low, is actually normal in about two-thirds of people with primary hyperaldo. So look at the potassium, but don't be falsely reassured by that. And you're gonna check a plasma aldosterone, it should be high, and the renin is gonna be low from suppression from the high aldo. And so you get this high aldo to renin ratio greater than 20. And when we look at the prevalence of primary hyperaldo in resistant hypertension, and this is due to hyperplasia of the adrenals, it can be somewhere in the teens to low 20s, so it certainly is out there. And that initial screen, when you're checking the aldosterone and renin, you do need to stop the mineralocorticoid antagonists. You'd have to stop spironolactone or plerinone and stop direct renin inhibitors. And there's controversy, but I think it's safe to continue for that initial screen at least, ACE inhibitors and other diuretics. And sometimes you need to do a confirmatory uh, test, either with a confirmatory saline suppression test or adrenal vein sampling and getting a CAT scan to look to see if this is an adenoma or if this is just hyperplasia. If it is an adenoma, the treatment's surgery. If it's hyperplasia, then the treatment really is spironolactone. Renal vascular disease, you're gonna have a separate lecture on this later today, so we won't go into that into, into detail. Other than to say the indications for screening, again, if you're a young patient under 30, be thinking about fibromuscular dysplasia, that accelerated hypertension, resistant hypertension, flash pulmonary edema, those are the patients I'm worried about. And then malignant hypertension, just ending with this, there's also controversy in terms of what the cutoff should be to describe malignant hypertension. Most consensus is greater than 120, I'm sorry, greater than 180 over 120, knowing that if folks' baseline blood pressure runs high in the 160s to 170s, then they are gonna be able to tolerate a much higher blood pressure than somebody who's de novo going up to that level. And really, the distinguishing factor between hypertensive urgency and emergency is symptoms or signs of end organ dysfunction. If you have that, it's emergency as opposed to urgency. Things like chest pain, pulmonary edema, shortness of breath, focal neurologic deficits, encephalopathy. And for that hypertensive urgency, it's usually due to just under-controlled chronic hypertension, and they don't have end organ dysfunction. With that hypertensive emergency, however, there's that target organ dysfunction. It's, those are the populations that we have to rapidly lower their blood pressure. So hypertensive encephalopathy, so the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, acute heart failure with pulmonary edema, MI, or dissection. And the treatment of hypertensive emergency, in those situations, you wanna to try to get the blood pressure down quickly. In that first hour, the MAP going down by more than 10 to 20%, and then that next 23 hours going down by an additional five to 15%. Except, and I changed this from the handouts, for acute ischemic stroke, it really depends upon if this is truly an ischemic stroke, then we allow that permissive hypertension, unless someone's blood pressure is greater than 220, or unless they're going for lytic therapy, in, in which case you're gonna to wanna to have their systolic blood pressure less than 185. And if someone has neurologic findings just due to hypertensive emergency, but this is not an ischemic stroke, then you can lower the blood pressure more quickly because we're, it's not being driven by an acute plaque rupture and thrombosis. With aortic dissection, we're gonna rapidly lower their blood pressure, and with acute MI or heart failure, likewise. So these last two tables are really busy, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in our last minute or so. With the vasodilators like fendolapan or nicardipine, because you get that reflex tachycardia, you have to use a beta blocker if you're gonna be treating patients with this for dissection or for acute MI. For nitroprusside, again, beta blocker because of the reflex tachycardia. Same thing with nitroglycerin, you need the beta blocker. 
And then enalaprilat, remember it's longer acting. Just using ACE inhibitors in acute MI for a prophylactic setting didn't bear out in this trial from the 1990s. But if someone's hypertensive with an acute MI, using enalaprilat is, uh, is fine to do. Just don't do it necessarily prophylactically if their blood pressure is normal. And then in terms of the beta blockers, obviously avoiding and acute decompensated heart failure. And then fentolamine is our go-to drug for pheochromocytomas. So that's a lot to cover in the last 35 minutes about hypertension. We've talked about treatment uh, based on stages of hypertension and cardiovascular risk, the challenges with integrating the JNC8 guidelines with SPRINT, resistant hypertension, then moved on to secondary causes of hypertension, and then treatment of hypertensive emergency. So the board pearls, just remember the guidelines for JNC8, the cutoffs they use, the role of thiazides and calcium channel blockers for black patients, indication for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, particularly for white coat hypertension, the role of lifestyle changes and when to add medications, and then resistant hypertension requires three drugs, including a diuretic, and our three-step approach, diuretics, maximizing the ACE slash ARB or calcium channel blocker, and then spironolactone, and then remember to evaluate for secondary causes of hypertension, and then some just little pearls for hypertensive emergency treatment. And with that, thank you, and good luck on the boards. Uh, thanks. Uh, whirlwind, uh, but beautifully laid out, and um, I, I don't know if you realize how Amy kind of synthesized things and simplified things for you so that you can manage, diagnose and manage these patients with hypertension. So let's first go to the questions. Uh, we'll answer the three questions and I'm going to throw in a lot of things that came in from the audience as we go along. But based on the JNC8 guidelines, which you are all well familiar with now, which of the following medications are recommended as an initial therapy for a 56-year-old black man with type 2 diabetes and hypertension? He has normal renal function and no proteinuria. Lisinopril, Valsartan, hydrochlorothiazide, or atenolol? Let's go for 95% correct. <laughs> You guys so, are awesome. <laughs> so, so the rule is that if you get more than 95% correct, you can give yourselves a round of applause. So <laughs> go ahead, round of applause. So Amy, I, so, so that was good. And, and we really lifted the audience there from 40% who didn't know what they were talking about. Now, here, here, here's a few more questions though. Um, the initial trials used chlorothalidone instead of hydrochlorothiazide, yet you were always kind of talking about hydrochlorothiazide. Can you comment on that? You know, I think we feel it's most, uh, it's class effect. You can really use either one, although you're right, the initial trials did use um, chlorothalidone. I think, as we were talking about, chlorothalidone is a more potent antihypertensive agent, and so if I'm really trying to get more of a blood pressure lowering effect, I do use a lot of chlorothalidone, um, but you really can choose either one. It's really a thiazide or thiazide like diuretic. Yeah. So, so either one would be appropriate, even though that the chlorothalidone was in the initial trials now. We're good with either one, mm -hmm. okay. And then, and then the other thing is um, spironolactone, you would kind of use that as a last resort, but some people say that if you know that your sodium load is okay, you can start with spironolactone. Can you want to talk about the use of spironolactone? No, absolutely. So I use a lot of spironolactone, and I wanted to outline the strategy from the JNC8 because that's what the boards is going to focus on, and spironolactone was considered a... Um, an option after you maximize the ACE, ARB, the calcium channel blockers, and the diuretics, then adding in spironolactone. Um, I think sometimes it's challenging to know how salt sensitive a patient really is. Uh, and typically, I am using diuretics as one of the first lines, but we were talking about the fact that there is so much of this um, secondary causes of hypertension with regards to that hyperaldosterone state. And I think that's why patients have a really profound lowering of their blood pressure when you start spironolactone. So in patients who seem that they have resistant hypertension, I'm pretty quickly adding spironolactone into the, into the mix. Okay. And we're going to start deviating because you guys asked a lot of questions, but you talked about primary aldol and how to diagnose it. Now, 
How does that help you? Once you diagnose this, are you going to do anything differently in treatment? Yeah, so that's, so that's a question that comes up a lot. Why don't we just put everyone on spironolactone? It's a good drug. That way we can blunt that hyperaldose state. So if somebody actually has an adrenal adenoma, so of the patients who have a hyperaldose state, two-thirds will be due to adrenal hyperplasia. So that we're just going to treat with spironolactone. The other third will have an adrenal adenoma. And if that's surgically resected, then their blood pressure will improve dramatically in 90% of patients. And there is essentially a 1% risk of having that adrenal adenoma be malignant. Uh, and so I think that in patients who have truly resistant hypertension, it's worthwhile to do the, the ALDO and the renin test. Again, you just would have to not have them on spironolactone or a direct renin inhibitor. And if that's flagging abnormal for a high renal or high um, aldo state, that's where I'm doing a CT scan to look to see do they have an adrenal adenoma or not. If they don't have an adrenal adenoma, then I'm just putting them back on spironolactone. But it's for the adrenal adenoma. Okay, perfect answer. Um, so, so that was the treatment of primary um, aldo. There were some questions about when you treat renal vascular disease, and because there are so many questions, we actually have a separate talk by Peter all up this <laughs> afternoon on renal vascular hypertension and when you intervene with your catheters and stents and things like that. So we'll save those questions for the afternoon where we can go more into it. Now let's go to question number two. 38-year-old woman, blood pressure readings at home in the 140s over 90 office blood pressure 149 over 87. She has one alcoholic beverage a day, her BMI is 32, she's a non-smoker, and she has no family history of coronary disease, and she does a good job of walking for 30 minutes a day. Um, medication, she had an OCP started six months ago. What is the most appropriate initial step for the management of her hypertension? Lifestyle changes, weight loss, discontinue alcohol, discontinue the oral contraceptive, or start hydrochlorothiazide. So go ahead and let's see what you would say for this. Oh, so still, so I, this is where I, I think it is controversial, and this is where the boards, you, as a, the test taking skill is that you have to pay close attention to that initial step. So if we think that her hypertension may be driven by the OCPs, and that to try to clarify, I actually added in um, earlier this week saying that the OCPs were started six months ago. You need to stop the medication. The blood pressure will go down in, in half. And then certainly I'm also telling her to do lifestyle changes and weight loss, absolutely. But in terms of that initial step, they, the boards would want you to identify that OCPs can be associated with hypertension and would want you to withdraw those to see if her blood pressure is going to be coming down. Absolutely, we'd also be doing lifestyle changes for certain, and if there was an option to do them both concurrently. But oftentimes the boards, they don't give you that, that option. So they want you to recognize the times you could have a medication side effect causing hypertension, because if you don't withdraw that drug, then you're potentially if the lifestyle and diet part doesn't work, having to then add another medication in just because of a medication side effect. It was just like Steve's question with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the patient on amlodipine. So you always want to do that first, but of course in practice we would do both. Now, somebody insightfully said, well, um, we, we, she, she really needs birth control. You're stopping the OCP. What would be the next recommendation that you would make for this woman? Absolutely, so it's a great question. So let's say that, we, that she was on oral contraceptive, we stopped it, her blood pressure came down. It's really the effect of blood pressure with OCPs is driven by the estrogen component. So she would be a candidate for a progestin-only OCP, um, or she would be a candidate for an IUD, and there are copper IUDs or progestin-only IUDs. Okay, good. Um, let's go a little bit more on the, um, uh, the outpatient um, uh, let's say, evaluation, because there is a lot of questions on the ambulatory blood pressure mm. monitor, and I'll ask two of them that I'd like you to address for the audience. Number one, should everybody actually get an ambulatory blood pressure monitor who will have the first diagnosis of hypertension? And number two is, will it get paid for? So you, you want to address those. So there are two, two good questions. The, um, you know, should everyone have one when they first get diagnosed with hypertension? 
you know, I don't think that's necessary in everyone, but I, the patients who I use them, and we're, we're fortunate that we have easy access to ambulatory blood pressure monitors in the clinic, but if patients who have, they say their blood pressure is well controlled at home, and then they come in, their blood pressure is always high in the office, you know, 150s, um, 160s, I'm doing an ambulatory blood pressure monitor just to be able to get more information. Maybe it really, truly is white coat hypertension, and then we can relax and they can relax, but if their blood pressure is not well controlled, which more often than not, that's the scenario we're in, then we need to titrate their medications and do a little bit more soul searching about the lifestyle changes. Um, if it, in terms of it's paid for, if you're ordering it in those scenarios, you know, for white coat hypertension, unsure about um, adequacy of blood pressure management as an outpatient, it, my experience has been it's always been paid for. Um, the other part that I mentioned during the talk was that there, I feel like in particular for women, they'll complain of this blood pressure being really high in the morning or our patients with sleep apnea. And then you find that their blood pressure is going down over the course of the day. Then the 24 hour blood pressure monitor for me is very helpful in those situations because sometimes I'm adjusting their medications only at night or actually taking down, reducing the doses of some of the morning medications just to try to prevent some of these falls and uh, rises in blood pressure during the day. Okay. And, and then, um you know, you were giving these guidelines of 140 over 90, but what about isolated systolic hypertension? There's been a lot of talk about that. What do you, what's your thought of that? So if you, so your diastolic is normal and just your Diastolic's yourself. pretty normal. You've got a wide pulse pressure. Your systolic's up to 150. I mean, what, what's the difference between isolated systolic hypertension and, and how you think about things and how you treat? I think it's controversial, you know, for, for certain. Um, I think that it depends upon how high the systolic blood pressure is and who the patient is, too. For instance, if you have a frail 82-year-old um, patient who has isolated systolic hypertension with systolics in the 150s, like 152, 155, and their diastolic level is quite low, it might be tempted just to leave the blood pressure alone. Whereas if you're an uh, otherwise healthy, robust patient who's 50, then I would probably treat that blood pressure despite it being an isolated systolic. Yeah, so it's, it's individualized, but the older people are going to have the wider pulse pressure, and they're the ones you might drop their pressure too much mm -hmm. if, you, if, you're, if you're too aggressive. And speaking of dropping the blood pressure too much, there was a, there, there was a great question on stroke. Mm -hmm. So you answered that, that and re-articulate re that if a person comes in with a stroke and hypertension, What's your goal for the blood pressure? So if, some, if it's an acute ischemic stroke, and I apologize for the error in the handout, that uh, if it's an acute ischemic stroke some, and someone's coming in, then if their systolic blood pressure is greater than 220, typically they'll, that will be treated. Or if they're coming in for an acute ischemic stroke and they're a candidate for lytics, then their systolic blood pressure needs to be less than 185. Otherwise, we allow permissive hypertension in the setting of acute ischemic stroke. The, on that table, what I had meant to have there was that if people have mental status changes and neurologic findings in the setting of hypertensive emergency, and it's not an acute ischemic stroke, that's where we're bringing the blood pressure down more quickly because then the neurologic findings are going to resolve. But if it's actually a plaque rupture and thrombosis or an embolic event causing an ischemic stroke, blood pressure greater than 220 will treat, or you want to have it less than 185 if you're going to get lytics, otherwise it's permissive hypertension. Yeah, so you'll, you'll allow them to have 160 or 170. But then what? I mean, let's say they start recovering from their stroke. Are you going to be more aggressive with their blood pressure um, uh, a month later or a couple weeks later? Or? You know, in terms of a lower blood pressure goal? Yeah, then. So, so you're scared during the first week or so mm -hmm. to lower blood pressure in a person with stroke because you don't want to stop their perfusion. Mm -hmm. But at what point in time do you start kind of getting more aggressive? I think typically the neurologists would say that, you know, within or outside of that first week to two weeks, yeah. then you could start to just manage the blood pressure otherwise that you, that, as you would. Yeah. And interestingly, again, the SPRINT trial uh, did not include patients who had prior stroke. So we don't know if we can apply that uh, more aggressive, intensive lowering of blood pressure less than 120 to people that have had prior stroke. Yeah, so, so practically, um, you wait about a week before you start intensive therapy, but then you just go to the same goal mm -hmm. that you'd like because what you want to do is you want to prevent recurrent mm -hmm. stroke. So, so that would be a very reasonable thing. Okay, let's go to now the acute and uh, question here. 
A 75-year-old woman who's not received routine medical care presents to the emergency department with severe chest pain radiating to her back and blood pressure of 210 with a heart rate of 115. And uh, everything's pointing to the fact that she's probably got a type A dissection. What medication do you recommend? Sodium nitroprusside, labetalol, hydralazine, or metoprolol? Ninety-two. Can't give themselves a round of applause, but we're close. <laughs> but you're close, but you want to talk about the difference between labetalol and nitroprusside then? And yeah, so really with, I mean, with nitroprusside or hydralazine, you're going to get that reflex tachycardia. And I've painted a picture of a lady who we're concerned about a dissection. She's already tachycardic. And so we don't want to have just that unopposed um, vasodilator without some sort of a beta blocker. If she'd already been on a beta blocker and her heart rate was in the 60s or 70s, and then you certainly could have chosen a different medication. But it's just knowing that uh, in the setting of the acute dissection, you'd need to have them on some beta blocker if you're using nitroprusside or hydralazine. So um, a Amy very nicely summarized the state of the art of the way we should be treated in patients with hypertension. But I will say that within the next six months, um, there is going to be some new guidelines coming out that are going to, actually, they're, they're going to make it easier for us. Um, we won't be able to talk about the guidelines for, uh, for fear of getting shot, <laughs> but I, I, I will say that when they do come out, you'll, you'll want to take a look at them because they actually will simplify things more than what we're seeing now, and they, they actually will kind of talk about the JNC8 versus the sprint and come to a very reasonable approach. So we'll look forward to seeing those.